Ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Lepofsky. I'm co-chair of the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee. Just make a uh, few brief opening remarks, and I'm happy to take your questions. I, uh, I'd like to begin by just indicating that uh, today is going to be a, a dramatic turning point uh, for the 17 percent of Ontarians who have a disability today, that's between one and a half and two million Ontarians who have a disability today, and the rest of Ontarians who at some point in their life will virtually all have a disability at some time or other. What those of us who have a disability today and those of you who will have a disability sometime in the future share in common is that we all live in a province that is full of far too many barriers that prevent people with disabilities from fully participating in jobs, in going to a restaurant, in going to a store, in getting on a bus. And we all have an interest in having those barriers removed. Today is a dramatic turning point for us for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, Today kicks off the first ever government-wide consultation on how to draft a new law to remove those barriers, to find them, to remove them, and to prevent new ones from ever arising again, to achieve a barrier-free society. And that, for people with disabilities, is an important breakthrough. We've gone from living in a society where governments think about uh, how much or how little to give us, and we've now got governments talking to us about what we need so we can be full participants, so that we can give and that we can benefit and we can fully participate, and so that we can make sure that the barriers we face today are never faced by any of you who get a disability in the future uh, again. That's an important turning point. Secondly, today is important because with the launch of this consultation, the coalition that I have the uh, privilege of serving, which includes individuals with every kind of disability you could think of from across this province and fully 85 community organizations from across this province that are interested uh, in the rights of people with disabilities, we had an opportunity this morning to spend 90 minutes across the table from the citizenship minister at the first consultation session to explain our vision for what a new Ontarians with Disabilities Act must include in order to achieve the barrier-free society that we all uh, seek. In that 90 minutes, we crammed in a very, very thorough, detailed description uh, of the kind of legislation we seek, of what kind of barriers need to be removed, and what kind of vigorous enforcement uh, mechanism is needed to make sure that they are removed in an orderly, sensible, practical, affordable way. We also outlined where there are some sharp and important differences between what we need uh, and uh, what the government is currently prepared to consider. The government of Ontario released a discussion paper three weeks ago to kick off this consultation. That discussion paper uh, made some important strides by indicating a, an understanding that we need to tackle the barriers people with disabilities face. But it also unfortunately included a stated intention to take two important options off uh, the table for discussion during the consultation. The two options it said it was taking off the table was uh, first imposing any kind of new regime of requirements in the area of the, of the workplace, requiring anything to be done uh, to take uh, to address barriers in the workplace. The government's position is that the only thing that, that they'll consider are voluntary measures. Voluntary measures means that employers may have barriers, may know about them, 
may be able to easily, in fact, immediately remove them, but don't have to. Uh, we put that, uh, but we were told that that was all that was prepared to be considered. Uh, we said that's not good enough. We said that people with disabilities uh, deserve better, and they need better. And so we put back on the table the idea of a practical and workable uh, law that will address not only the barriers in accessing health care and hospitals, uh, parking lots and, uh, or pardon me, parking uh, activities and uh, uh, recreational services, stores, restaurants and the like, but jobs as well. Secondly, the government took off the table in its discussion paper the idea of creating a new uh, agency to enforce this new law. We said that people will need both the uh, help and the assistance and the effective enforcement of an agency that can handle this new workload. The government said that job would fall to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and we explained that, frankly, uh, the Human Rights Commission doesn't have the budget, the resources, uh, and the capacity to take on any new work. Uh, and to give this new job to that commission uh, would surely not uh, achieve any progress uh, for us. But in any event, while we were able to outline where we agreed and try to offer uh, 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 delineate where we differ and offer suggestions on how to make an Ontarians with Disabilities Act that's strong and effective. Uh, we have at least provided, as best we can, a detailed description of what we say and what people with disabilities have told us from across this province they need to remove the barriers they face in a practical, reasonable, orderly way. The third reason today is very important is not because of what's already happened today, but, by what, uh, by, uh, but pertains to what's going to happen today in just about an, uh, two and a half hours from now. We're going to have a very exciting event here in a couple of hours. In a couple of hours, people with disabilities from the Toronto area and beyond are going to come to this place to go into legislative committee rooms to make presentations on what they think uh, this new law should say and uh, what barriers they face, and to make those presentations face to face to members of all three parties that sit in the legislature. These will look like and sound like and indeed be like legislative hearings that happen here all the time. The dramatic difference is these hearings, these meetings, were not called by the government. They were not called by the legislature. They were called by our voluntary coalition. We're delighted that all three parties accepted our invitation, that all three have agreed to send uh, representatives, MPPs, to preside. We have no idea how many people are going to show up, but we've done our best with our volunteers to plan to deal with them all, to have sign language interpretation, copies of materials in Braille, uh, closed uh, real-time captioning, and as many accommodations as we could pack in in a couple of weeks of intense planning. And we're going to give people an opportunity in an open, accessible process to say what they think this law should look like to their MPPs. We don't consider this a substitute for the kind of consultation the government should conduct. We're providing this as an example of what we say the government uh, should do to consult with the people. And so we encourage you to come to see what's going on, to talk to the people that are coming here, and hear what they have to say. They'll present a wide range of different views. They'll talk from the heart. They'll talk about the barriers they face in their real life. Because we're convinced that the more politicians and the more voters that hear from us about the barriers we face and the barriers all voters will face in their lifetime when they get a disability. They won't want to live that way. They'll want something better and they'll vote for strong law. So with that, um, I'd be pleased to take, uh, take your questions and uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just telling me who you're from. I'm not good at recognizing faces. This is Bosque Hal Vincent from CFRB. Uh, did you get anywhere when you met with the minister? You've got these two key areas to talking about the voluntary aspect and the enforcement agency. Did she give any ground, or did she say the white paper is, is a, a starting point? Uh, the minister listened. And uh, when, we, uh, when we said that certain things may have been taken off the table by the discussion paper, but we're putting them right back on the table, and we're encouraging others to do the same, nobody interrupted, nobody cut us off. The minister listened and took notes. And uh, we've encouraged the minister to take back our ideas and to urge the government to reconsider those decisions. 
and we uh, hope that, uh, that we'll be successful. Antonello Artuso, Toronto Sun, were you given any indication of when this legislation might be ready to actually be uh, brought in? Uh, not today. I will say that the prior Minister of Citizenship, uh, Marilyn Mashinsky, when we asked her about a year ago to provide timelines, um, she said mid to late fall of 98. That's important because when the Premier promised us uh, that he would enact this legislation in his first term, uh, we pointed out that um, we've learned from the federal government that first terms uh, can vary in length uh, from very long to relatively surprisingly short, and we needed time for this thing to get into the legislature, to get debated. Uh, uh, we'd like to see full legislative hearings and so on. And uh, so that's why we asked for that, those timelines. Now, uh, since last fall, we've asked the new minister whether she was going to follow those timelines. And um, up until now, up until recently, she hadn't uh, given a specific response. But we do understand from reading uh, in the press uh, that she has, uh, that the minister has said on behalf of the government that their aim is to introduce this law this fall. Uh, and if you think about the, pos the rumors of possible spring election and so on, um, that would seem to be the, the outside that they could do if they're only if there's going to be an election in the, in the spring. Obviously, that's information that's, that we have no uh, access to. When you talk about mandatory measures in the workplace, what are you looking at? What, what would you like to see? Well, we, we, uh, we're looking at uh, something that's workable and that's practical uh, and that's sensible, but that will actually do something. Uh, and we've suggested, um, among the measures we're suggesting, uh, is the notion that employers should have an obligation, excuse me, an obligation to take steps to identify the barriers they now have and then to make a plans for an orderly process of removing them and preventing new ones within their capacity, their resources, uh, and their size, and so on, sensitive to what's practical. Um, we've also suggested that uh, to facilitate this, they should be, uh, uh, th th there could be a, a process of having employers uh, develop uh, a plan where they identify the barriers they found and they, um, they uh, indicate the kind of things that they propose to do and the kind of timelines they propose uh, to try to achieve. At the first level, we'd like to see them uh, just go about this themselves. Most don't do this at all. Uh, and just the very process of going through that, pro uh, that exercise uh, would, would really uh, help move things forward. We've also suggested uh, that it would be of great assistance both to employers and to others uh, bound by this legislation uh, and of great assistance to people with disabilities themselves that, uh, that there be a um, uh, procedure in place for the government to make regulations addressing particular sectors of the economy, uh, setting out the kinds of barriers that should be removed and the kind of timelines that are reasonable and practical. But those regulations should be made after the government has gotten informed input from all the affected stakeholders, people with disabilities explaining their needs, business or government expect explaining what's practical or what difficulties they might encounter. The idea then is that those kind of regulations could give, uh, give people very clear indication of what they have to do so they don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, we also think that this should be backed up by practical assistance, uh, technical assistance, um, uh, for example, information, places they can call to find out uh, what works, what doesn't work, and so on. Um, and that's an important area where we and the uh, government's discussion paper um, respectfully are uh, approaching this from different perspectives. The government, in, in talking about voluntary measures, expresses a view that it would be great to, to, um, to try things like public education. Let's go educate employers and others on, on what people with disabilities need in the workplace and so on. Now, we're not against public education. In fact, the 85 organizations that form our coalition and the individuals in our coalition have probably done more than anyone in this province to try to educate employers and others on the barriers we face. And we've learned from hard experience that it just doesn't solve the problem. People with disabilities deserve better. And so we've said that what will make public, edu public education work is if it's backed up by a law that is strong, effective, and has teeth. So they need both the obligation to take these steps and the assistance to take these steps.
and we think both should be set out. We don't know. We reiterated. We've, we wrote the uh, premier. We wrote the leaders of all three parties because this event today is a nonpartisan event, just as we're a nonpartisan coalition. Uh, we uh, wrote the premier and the other two party leaders uh, a couple of weeks ago, just after we found out uh, the scheduling for these um, summertime consultation uh, stakeholder meetings that the minister is holding. And we invited all of them to send uh, MPPs. We indicated uh, more recently that we expected we might be running up to four meeting rooms because we don't know what the total number of people that are going to show up uh, today. People have to deal with getting wheel trans and other uh, barriers just getting here. Um, and we, we told them we need up to four. Uh, if we could get four MPPs, that would be great. We, we've got a couple of names uh, from the, the government. We've got uh, one or two. We've got uh, names from the, the two other parties. and. But uh, we understand there could be more, and we're not sure. But we've had no indication that either the minister or her parliamentary assistant, Derwin Shea, will be coming. Uh, we encourage them to. Uh, the minister is doing the consultation meetings for the government in Toronto, and her parliamentary assistant, Derwin Shea, uh, is doing the meetings uh, in seven other centres across Ontario over the month of August. Did you express to her though this morning that We've made that message clear in writing, and we reiterated that message today. But I must say that we spent the majority, the vast majority of our time today, uh, was spent, uh, indeed, almost the entirety of our time today with the minister was spent outlining in detail what we would like to see the legislation contain, and uh, responding to the discussion paper because we felt that uh, 90 valued minist uh, minutes uh, meeting uh, w with uh, with the minister was an important opportunity, and we wanted to use it to best advantage to to make our to get our point across. John, John Darby from Global. Who will be representing the uh, government? Today? Yes. Um, I believe one of the MPPs is here today. I, we got a call last week, uh, and I'm not sure her, who, unfortunately. Uh, we got a call last week. I believe Mr. Jim Brown is is planning to attend, and I, we just, uh, we don't know, but in fairness to everybody, this is all being pulled together, and uh, I think that the, uh, at fairly short notice for everybody. Access. My name is Colin Bowen of City TV. Um, access for the disabled has been pretty much an established fact at the municipal level for 25 years. Um, there's been a lot of done. I mean, new buildings are, regular, are required to provide <coughs> access. There's been a lot of retrofitting. Uh, where are the gaps? Uh, let me uh, take on each sentence of what you just said. Firstly, new buildings that have been required to be accessible were often required to be made accessible. Uh, on standards that were, were not adequate. Often they didn't, for example, include uh, requirements for people with visual impairments uh, and so on. So that often you, you, you'll hear stories from people in wheelchairs and, and if you come later this afternoon, you, you ask them, they can all tell you about uh, getting to the ramp but finding it's too steep to go up or finding that they get inside a building and then there's two stairs or even that there's an automated door with a button on it but they can't reach it because it was put too high up. Um, retrofit, uh, the building code right now only addresses that part of the building that's renovated. Um, there have been some very modest changes to the building code in recent time, but they don't cover a lot of what's needed. But it's just a classic example. Go out tonight in your car, if you are able to walk and able to see and able to drive, and start determining how many restaurants you've got to choose from you want to go to if you're in a wheelchair. How many of them? may just have two or three steps out front or even just one step that a, a low price ramp could uh, could fix. Right now they don't, uh, under the building code, they don't have to do anything about that. Uh, just as one example. Uh, other gaps that exist, this is, fa it's actually interesting, when la over the past two years my uh, coalition, who are all volunteers and voluntary agencies, uh, we went out and surveyed our own membership and, and the the clients and, and consumers associated with the organizations that belong to us. And we asked them about the barriers we face, and we put them together in a brief. And I think the list of barriers is about 50 single space pages. Whether it's physical access, like getting to the hospital but not being able to find a bathroom you can use, um, or it's information barriers, like uh, uh, going to uh, get some information or a form the government wants you to fill out, but if you're, you're blind as I am, uh, not having the information available in uh, an alternative format, um, or it's, God knows, bank machines, a uh, bane of the existence of lots of folks who, who have disabilities who either can't reach them, or if they can reach them, they can't, there's no way to read what's on the screen. And some of the new machines 
are even worse than some of the old machines because they got flatter buttons that you can barely, uh, you can't feel the difference uh, between. Um, the range of barriers are pretty dramatic. There's also communication barriers. Last, just as an example, last fall, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously declared under the Charter of Rights that provincial governments are obliged to make sure that if a person who's deaf goes to the hospital and needs medical care and needs to be able to communicate with their doctor, that there be uh, reasonable efforts to provide sign language interpreters. And that's a service that's still largely not uh, available. There'll be deaf people here this afternoon. You can ask them what happens if they have an emergency or their kid has an emergency and they got to go to an emergency ward. Um, these are the kind of barriers that are uh, a, part of our, a part of our daily life. Uh, and that are part of the daily life of all the people who are coming this afternoon. And, and we want MPPs from all parties to hear about the actual experience these folks have because once they hear about it and once they know all their voters are exposed to living the exact same way, uh, we think they'll vote for a strong law that will change that. Any questions? We've indicated that this is that there are going to be costs involved, and there's going to be some restructuring involved. One of the points that we made to the government, uh, the government's discussion paper says that they, uh, uh, that for example, and I'll get right to the issue of bucks in one second, but the government's uh, discussion paper says that any new legislation should be consistent with the government's goals and objectives uh, more broadly. Uh, we pointed out that there may be some restructuring involved, but uh, this government certainly has a record of being prepared to do some rather serious restructuring in areas like health care, education, municipal government, and so on. So uh, the idea of restructuring is not foreign to the way uh, uh, government achieves its uh, objectives. With respect to the cost issue, um, we have data from the United States, uh, which we presented today from the Americans with Disabilities Act, which, by the way, we're not trying to carbon copy. We stole the name, but we want to uh, borrow some of where the Americans have succeeded in making a more accessible society than ours, but we also want to learn from what they've done uh, ineffectively and that we'd like to improve. Uh, but we found that most of the accommodations they found uh, cost very little uh, or cost indeed nothing. Moreover, preventing new barriers costs nobody for the most part and yet saves money down the line. With respect to those barriers where there are costs, um, we uh, are wide open to a dialogue on, on how to deal with that cost. Government will have a role to play. This government is, seems to have accepted that government has a role to play financially because in the budget last spring, they announced tax incentives for employers uh, who have to spend money to accommodate the needs of employees with, with disabilities. Um, our response to the minister today, and this is when we start, wh why we're, you know, we're happy to be able to talk about um, substance, but our response to the minister today is that there already are tax incentives out there. In, in other words, a, a company can write off uh, the costs of accommodating the needs of a person uh, with a disability now. We assume that any tax incentive that they're thinking of passing is going to have to include something more than 100 percent write-off or, or a relatively fast depreciation if you want to get into the, the tedium of, of tax. And our, our suggestion to the government is if they're going to do that, it may make more practical sense to do a direct subsidy that you apply for rather than a tax write-off that, uh, that you don't because then we have a better sense of how much money is being spent and whether it's actually, uh, we meaning society, has a, ch a chance to see that it makes sense, that the, the expenditure is worth it, that it's getting us somewhere, it's not being um, uh, used for, for, for something else uh, and so on. The other point that we made on this very point uh, in this very area is that the government's idea of tax incentives in the employment area, which is essentially all they say they're prepared to do. They, they don't want to do anything mandatory. So the employers can do, remove a barrier if they want, but they can look a barrier straight in the eye and say, it may cost you nothing, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave you there. Uh, and on their discussion papers approach, that's okay. Uh, we said that tax incentives may help somewhat, but they, alone, they won't do anything in, in, in organizations that don't pay tax. The, provincial government, municipal governments, universities, colleges, the broader public sector, uh, they're going to need help uh, too. Um, and uh, a direct subsidy uh, system would be more sensible because they could have access uh, to it also. 
so that's that's the case. So, but it's important. One of the very common stereotypes in the disability field is that somehow addressing our barriers always costs a lot. There are times it will cost. We say the cost is worth it, but it's going to take time because you can't do everything at once. We're practical. Uh, but uh, we also say that we have to look at the cost to society if we don't do something about this. The cost to society if we don't address the barriers we now face and don't prevent new ones is having to uh, face more and more people with disabilities on social assistance when they'd rather be in jobs, more and more funding for parallel public transit because there's no accessible public transit, uh, more and more funding uh, to clean up the mess that we could uh, in the future or that we leave to our children instead of uh, fixing it now. So it's always important to look not only at the costs of doing something but of the greater costs of not. Other questions? Thank you all very much. We hope you'll be able to stay around and we'll be around for between now and then.